All right. Oh, hopefully that's fine. Today is going to be a fun day, a really fun, fun day. Because I screwed over the inch 130 kids. <laughs> I built up a lot of goodwill with them. I recorded all my lectures, even though I'm not teaching the class this semester. I made them love me. And then they have a midterm on Saturday. And I got multiple requests saying, Clayton, can you do a, a review? Who am I to say no <laughs> to the inch 130 kids? So I'm going to do a review, but it's not going to be until later in the week. But I didn't tell them that. All I did was post in their e-class Clayton's NG130 midterm review. <laughs> They're going to lose their minds. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to see that. Uh, if you guys have an opportunity that great, you have to take it. No matter what happens, you have to take it. Right. Oh, that's what I spent my morning doing at least. All right, so go to here. We'll go back. All right, full screen. All right, wonderful, wonderful. All right, so today we're going to be talking about the last topic before midterm number two. So midterm number two, as you guys know, next Thursday. Same format, same time frame as midterm number one. And it's going to cover from strain. So when we first started talking about strain up until today. So today's stuff right here, it will be on the midterm. It will be. You guys say, Clayton, come on. It's not a lot of time. Today's theory is simple. Very simple. It's all derivations. If you guys looked at the lecture notes, it's all derivations. Do I test you on derivations? No. I test you on the final product. Essentially, today, we are going to be looking at those two parameters that we had in our stiffness matrix. You guys remember what they were? What are the two parameters we need to create a relationship between stress and strain? Who remembers one of them? A little bit louder. Nothing. Young's modules. Poisson's ratio. I'm hoping that rings a bell. <laughs> so we're going to talk about those two. Because before we just said, here's our tensor. It's a function of the Young's modulus. It's a function of Poisson's ratio. And we just left it at that. It turns out for something to be stable, and we're going to talk about what I mean by stable, there are certain restrictions or limitations to those two parameters. They can only be within a certain range. That's all we're going to talk about today. What are the ranges of Poisson's ratio and the Young's modulus so that our actual deformation is stable? That's all we're going to talk about today. Once you guys have those limits, you guys will be good to go for the midterm. So again, today's material will be on the midterm. The stuff we do on Thursday will not be on the midterm. Thursday is when we get into beams. Beams will not be on the midterm. I want to make that clear. All right. Perfect. So I have some announcements too. <laughs> I'm going to start canceling some things. So my office hours I put as Tuesday and Thursday. They're now just going to be Thursday. The reason why? Well, no one shows up. <laughs> And I'm sitting there going, wow, I wish I can go eat. But then the student might come. <laughs> so I'm going to move them over to Thursday. Now, typically, once I go grab my food, I'll be back in my office. So if you guys do have questions, feel free to swing by. Chances are I'll be there still, and I'm happy to answer anything. You guys can always email me. You guys can always set up appointments. Pretty flexible. All right, so office hours, Thursday only. That's the only time I seem to actually have students come. Uh, Tuesday, I just kind of sit there staring at my computer. <laughs> the second thing is I'm not going to do online seminars anymore. So I guess this doesn't really apply to you guys. It applies to you guys in the camera. No more online seminars. The reason why, for the past four of them, I've only gotten three students. I, and they're all, they've all been different. It's been one student, one student, one student. And then last week, there is nobody. I thought, well, I'm not going to record nothing because I have it recorded from last year. So I'm just going to post my recordings from last year. Now, for the people that are in person, this is going to apply to you guys. 
what's going to start happening is these last couple of assignments, 7, 8, 9, and 10, they're very mathematical heavy. It's all solving differential equations. The reason why I let you guys kind of struggle with that differential equation, assignment, what is it, 5, or G? Everyone didn't like that. Because that's all we're going to be doing now, solving differential equations. So I wanted you guys to get used to it. Now, in the in-person seminars, I will be showing you the steps. I'll go over the theory, I'll show you the steps, but I'm not going to show you the Mathematica. My hope is that you try it yourself. What? You're not gonna show me the Mathematica, how am I gonna solve it? All the recordings that I have go into the Mathematica. If you guys look on the assignments kind of section, I have my recorded seminars, which go through the Mathematica, but then I also have those assignment guides. In those assignment guides, especially for assignment seven, eight, nine, and 10, I go through Mathematica completely. I almost solved the entire question for you. All right, so if you guys want to just go see the code, copy it, get your marks and leave, sure. I'm not gonna stop you, but I do want you guys to at least try to solve it by yourself. But again, if you guys are struggling, saying Clayton's too mean, make me do Mathematica, it's on E-Class, it's already recorded. You guys just have to go to those assignment guides I explain Mathematica, everything, okay? So Mathematica won't be covered in person here today in the seminar, but it is available online. So you guys do have that resource. I don't want you guys to think I'm giving you the shaft or anything like that. Another thing too is uh, today, I guess this week, so today and Thursday, will be the last time I will be doing the seminars. What? Yes. So one of the beautiful things about being a graduate student is you get to learn how to teach. Learn how to teach. May not know it, but we actually have two TAs in this class. They're both PhD students, and they've been responsible for coding the assignments. But I think that if you're a PhD student, chances are you want to become a professor. And we've all seen way too many times what happens when professors don't get teaching experience before they start. So I want to try and give these two guys, you guys will meet them, opportunities to actually learn how to teach. So next week, seminar, what is it? For assignment eight, you guys will have one TA. And then for seminar nine, you guys will have a different TA. Again, if you guys want what I do, it'll all be online. I have my seminars from last year recorded and I have the assignment guides. I have all the resources there, but I want to try and give these guys a chance to have some experience. Typically what happens is PhD students are scared of you guys. They think you're mean. Are you guys mean? No? Yeah, exactly. You guys are nice, at least for the most part. <laughs> no, I've, I've never had any bad experiences with you guys. I've gotten, Clayton, you coded your assignment wrong many times, but that's about the extent of it. So yeah, you guys are nice, and I want them to see how nice you guys are. So that's going to be office hours and now seminars moving forward. So everybody clear? Hopefully. Any questions about the midterm? Midterm, again, same format as last time. 25 multiple choice questions all the way from strain until now. That's it. So topics, I guess, four, five, six, seven. I'm not sure. Strain, stress, momentum balance, and constitutive laws. I'll send out an email for everybody that really drive the point home. So if there's no questions, we will start on today's lecture, which is energy restrictions of the elastic moduli. So this elastic moduli here, this is referring to those parameters, the Sons ratio, as well as the Young's modulus. Again, if we want something to be physically possible, we can impose restrictions mathematically to ensure that, which is great. Once I start restrict restricting the range of values, it's easier to find a solution. All right, so we're going to talk about that. So energy restrictions on the elastic moduli. Last lecture, we determined the elasticity tensors that relate stresses to strains. You guys remember that? And we said in general, they contain two parameters, a Young's modulus and a Poisson's ratio. For an isotropic linear elastic material, we determined this. And we said it's actually two parameters. So we got Poisson's ratio nu, Young's modulus E. And we said even though there's technically that third parameter, it's just a function of Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. So it's actually two parameters. 
And I say in general, because if we look at the orthotropic case, Young's modulus differs in every direction, but it's still Young's modulus. It's just E11, E22, or E33. So in general, all these linear elastic materials are going to have these two parameters. And up until now, we said, well, they can just be anything. I give you whatever Young's modulus, I give you whatever Poisson's ratio, you substitute it in, you're good to go. It turns out to be stable, which is enforcing two physical restrictions, we can actually impose mathematical restrictions. So we're going to impose two physical restrictions. The first one is that our material is stable, and then the second one is our material is deformable. The deformable parts, I'm sure you guys have no problem picturing. I know the light is annoying, <laughs> nothing I can do. But in this whole class, we're analyzing deformable objects. Does it make sense that if I were to take an object in real life and I were to put some stress on it, that there is no strain? No, even if I just do this, am I putting strain onto this podium, even just this little touch? Yes, the strain is just going to be tiny, 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 tiny. But that's what happens in real life. When you put a force on something, you're going to strain it. The amount of strain, that's what differs. So that's the first one we're going to do. Our object is deformable. And then the second one is the material is stable. Now this is where things start to get complex because every course you take, they talk about stability, but they're always in different terms. Who's taking 372? You guys talk about geometric stability, right? Young's little triangles. What does that mean? What are you guys trying to ensure by checking if it's geometrically stable? <laughs> How is your midterm? <laughs> Basically, in that class, you're making sure that a structure is restrained so that if I were to push it in a certain direction, it doesn't just fly away. For instance, if I had two rollers at the bottom of something, this thing right here, imagine if this was my structure, all right, and I just put rollers underneath. What happens when I put a lot of the load? You don't want that in your building. So that's why we check geometric stability in terms of 372. Now, who's in 374? You guys are doing steel. Did you guys talk about the stability of steel? Yes. What do you guys check when you guys are doing columns? I hear it. Come on. You guys know it? Local buckling. I made something local buckle in the lab. It was terrible. <laughs> I, I looked like an idiot. So basically, you check different types of buckling. Buckling is instability. So you got global buckling, where the column itself buckles to the side. And you got local buckling, where if you have stress concentrations on the flanges or the web of the steel, it'll buckle. That's local buckling. The actual column, that's global buckling. Again, it's, to, it's related to stability. So then comes Clayton. When you say something is stable, what do you mean by that? Because again, there's different definitions depending on which course. When I'm talking about stability in this course, it's going to be the most simplest form. If I were to take something and I were to stretch it uniaxially, okay, so I'm pulling it in the horizontal direction, is this going to have a tensile strain or a compressive strain? If I were to pull it in the horizontal direction, pull it, tensile. What I mean by stable is that that's what happens. Something that I call unstable is if I were to pull it and it starts compressing. Can you guys picture that? No, it makes no sense. When you pull something, it's gonna go into tension. When I compress something, it's going to go into compression. That's what I mean by stable. If something is unstable, it's like if I were to compress this and this were to somehow grow if I'm compressing it, it makes no sense. That's what I mean by stable. And we do this based on strain energy. Will strain energy be tested on the midterm? What do you guys think? You guys have seen it a couple times now. No. <laughs> strain energy is something we use to derive a lot of these equations or restrictions. Strain energy, if you guys look in the course, is topic nine, something we cover after the midterm. So strain energy will not be on the midterm. The stuff we derive will be, strain energy won't be. Well, that's no big deal because strain energy is simple. 
we said if we have a linear elastic response, strain energy is just going to be the area under this curve. That's it. And we said, okay, if we have a triangle, well, then the strain energy density is going to be one half of sigma times epsilon. And we talked about in the last lecture that we have a relationship between sigma and epsilon. So I can write it as follows. One half of C times epsilon multiplied by epsilon. Now this is for the uniaxial case. What did I say we have to do when we have a triaxial case? Remember, we don't just have sigma one one, we have two two, three three, one two, one three, etc. Basically, all we do is we take the summation. So this right here would be for sigma one one, we'd have the same formula for sigma two two. So if I were to say our strains are actually six different strain components, this would be our strain energy density. Sigma one one, epsilon one one, plus sigma two two, epsilon two two, etc. And this is the formula that we are going to use to prove everything. <clears throat> because what happens is if our material is stable and deformable, the strain energy stored, so this parameter right here, it has to be positive. So that's the key. This is what we're working with. This equation right here has to be greater than zero for something to be stable. Okay? So let's go to an isotropic material. Isotropic material. Remember, this was the easy one. So one method of determining energy restrictions for E and B for an isotropic linear elastic material is based upon the definition of strain energy density. The definition. We said that our strain energy, which is one half of epsilon multiplied by C times E, has to be greater than zero. So hopefully that doesn't lose you guys. But remember, this right here actually has six components and this right here has six components. And if we go back to the previous slide, I'm just gonna go back. All we're doing is taking the first two components, multiplying them, the second two components, multiplying them, the third components, multiplying, and adding them together. Does that remind you of a mathematical operation? Multiplying each component by each other and then adding them all together. What is that? Dot problem, exactly. So all we can do is we can say, okay, this expression is actually equivalent to this, one half of epsilon dotted with C E. All right, so hopefully I didn't lose you guys. You guys are saying, okay, well, who cares? You just wrote it fancier. This right here is very, very special. If you guys remember from linear algebra, or I'm not sure, I don't re remember linear algebra, so I'm assuming it's in there. This right here, this parameter greater than zero, this actually implies that this matrix here, C, is positive definite. If you guys search up positive definite, this is the actual definition. So since we have this definition, we know C is positive definite. Our elasticity tensor, positive definite. Do you guys need to know positive definite for the midterm? No. You guys just need to know what we derive at the end. Because if something is positive definite, it has to have positive eigenvalues, positive non-zero eigenvalues. So what we're going to do is we are going to take the eigenvalues of C. Now C, as we know, is six by six. How many eigenvalues should it have? Six by six, how many eigenvalues? Six. When you guys take the eigenvalues, you're gonna get three. And this one, you guys go, Clayton, think you lost it. They should be six. Well, it turns out that some of these are actually just duplicated. So this is eigenvalue one. This one appears twice. And then this one at the end appears three times. So there is six, but basically we have three different eigenvalues. Now, again, if this is positive definite, we said that all of these eigenvalues have to be greater than zero. All three of them, or I guess all six of them technically. They all have to be greater than zero. So if we were to look at this and analyze these equations, we can determine specific limits of E as well as Poisson's ratio nu to ensure that this is the case. So for the Young's modulus, E, for this to be a stable material, 
e has to be greater than zero. So again, I don't test you guys on the derivation. I test you on what's produced. This is what's produced. Our Young's modulus has to be greater than zero. That's the first condition for a stable material. Sound good? For a Poisson ratio, nu, it has to be between negative one and one half. So for a linear elastic isotropic material, these are the two conditions that we have. We're going to do some examples later to see what happens if they're outside of this realm or equal. So that's another thing too. Can my Poisson's ratio be equal to one half? What do you guys think? No. You see, it's not equal to, it's either greater than negative one or less than one half, it's never equal. Okay, so these are the two conditions. Now, I kind of went fast through this one because the best way to actually explain this isn't by talking about straight linear algebra. Linear algebra is boring. We can actually derive the exact same things by just analyzing different uh, applications of applied stress. That's it. If we were to look at this and say, okay, we have case one, where we just examine a uniaxial stress. If we have uniaxial stress, we know that our stress tensor is going to be something as follows. We have a uniaxial stress, sigma one one, and the rest is equal to zero. If we have this now, can we find strains? If I know the stresses, can I find strains? Yes. So what I can do is say, okay, we have a nice relationship for isotropic materials, and I know that my stress is sigma one one and the rest is zero. So I can determine my strains as follows: epsilon one one, sigma one one over E, epsilon two two, negative sigma one one times B over E, etc. This is when we go back to the concept of strain energy. We also know that we have a strain energy density function, and for it to be stable, it has to be greater than zero. It looks really bad right now, but what is sigma 2, 2? Zero. What is sigma 3, 3? Sigma 1, 2? Zero. Most of these are zero. So all that cancels, and we get that our strain energy density for this particular case is just one half of sigma 1, 1 times epsilon 1, 1. Do I have sigma 1, 1? or sorry, epsilon one one in terms of sigma. Can I replace it in terms of sigma? Yes, I have a relationship over here. So I could say, okay, epsilon one one is just sigma one one divided by the Young's modulus. So I can put that into my equation and then I get the following. My strain energy density is equal to sigma one one squared over two e, and this has to be greater than zero. Is sigma one one, or sorry, is the term up top, is the numerator ever going to be negative? No, because it's squared. I can have a negative sigma one one, but after I square it, it's going to become positive. What does this imply for E? What does E have to be for this expression to hold true? Has to be greater than zero. So this is how we can kind of determine the first one. Again, these are just to show you guys how we get it. The only thing I want you guys to remember is that it has to be greater than zero. Let's go on to the next one. Case two, a shear stress. So we know that for a shear stress, we can have sigma one, two, and the rest can be zero. We're going to do the exact same thing we did before, where if I know my stresses, I can then find my strains, and I get that my strains are equal to the following. So the only strain that we have is shear strain, epsilon one, two, which is equal to two times sigma one, two, 1 plus nu divided by e. I, I don't expect you guys to remember this, but e divided by 1 plus nu was actually something that we had before. This is actually the shear modulus right here. So in the end, we get that sigma 1, 2 is equal to, or sorry, this, uh, this here is equal to sigma 1, 2 divided by 2g. I think the 2s actually cancel out. I'll have to check that again. So if we substitute this into our strain energy density, we know that all these are going to cancel, except for this term right here. So this is going to be our density formula. If I were to look at epsilon one, two, well, we have a relationship. And at the end, we get that our strain energy density is sigma one, two squared 
over 2G, this has to be greater than zero. So what does our shear modulus G have to be? Greater than zero. Because even if this was negative, the squared makes this positive. So this right here, the shear modulus has to be greater than zero. And Clayton, well, why do we care about the shear modulus? Before I was only concerned with the elastic modulus and Poisson's ratio. Well, now if we know that G has to be greater than zero, and we know the expression for G, is this a fair statement? E divided by two multiplied by one plus nu greater than zero? Yes. If we know from before that E will always be positive, what is the only way this can be less than zero? Let's put it this way. What is the value of nu that would make this equal to zero? Negative one. So what happens if I put in negative two? Will this be positive or negative? Negative. So we know that negative one's that limit, and if we want it positive, we know that the sans ratio of nu has to be greater than negative one. What is the shear modulus? Who knows who cares, right? The shear modulus gives us an idea of basically the effect of shear stress on an object. It relates our shear stresses to shear strains. So what happens if I were to put in Poisson's ratio equal to negative one? What is my denominator going to be if it's equal to negative one? Zero. The denominator is zero, so what would G be? Theoretically infinite. What does this mean? It means that if I were to have an object, let's say the table, and I were to try and shear it, no matter how much stress I put on it in shear, it's not going to shear at all. It's rigid when it comes to shear, which we know is impossible. So that's kind of that restriction down there. We can go to the third case because remember, Poisson's ratio was kind of wedged between two values. We have one of them. We can determine the last one for hydrostatic stress. So for hydrostatic stress, sigma is just going to be a diagonal tensor of PPP, the rest are equal to zero. And again, I'm just following the same thing I did before. I can find my strains and I get the following. So it's starting to look pretty ugly. When it comes to my strain energy density, what is, is sigma one, one, zero? No? What is it equal to? P. What is epsilon a function of? What is epsilon a function of? Is it also a function of P? Yes. So what happens is these terms cancel, we're left with these three, but as we can see, it's not too bad because sigma one, one, sigma two, two, sigma three, three, are they all the same? Yes. Epsilon one, one, epsilon two, two, and epsilon two, three, which we get over here, are they all the same? Yes. So it does simplify nicely. Instead of doing it three times, I could have just went three over two, multiplied by this once. But basically, you're left with this equation over here. Now, if we look at the denominator, it has E at the bottom. We already said that E will always be positive. So is our denominator going to always be positive? Yes, that's not a concern. So we look to the numerator. Is three always going to be positive? Yes, it's just a number. P squared, always positive? Yes. So the only thing that can make this negative is this term right here. So my question for you guys, what would be the value of nu to make it equal to zero? Equal to zero. One half. If I wanted this negative, would I have to go above one half or below? Above. So what we can conclude from this is that Poisson's ratio nu has to be less than one half. We're going to talk about it later, but this limit right here is related to basically volumetric strain. If this is equal to one half, equal to one half, as we're going to see our bulk modulus k that we talked about in the last lecture, that's going to be equal to infinity. Before we had the shear modulus as infinity. In this case, we have the bulk modulus. And the bulk modulus, I kind of hinted at it, 
It's a measure of how easily I can compress something. If this is equal to infinity, it means that under hydrostatic loads, so if I were to compress something at all sides equally, it's never going to expand or contract. It's going to stay the same, which we know is not true. If I were to take a cube and I were to start compressing it in every direction, is it going to start deforming? Yes. If this is equal to one half, it's the equivalent to saying it doesn't deform at all, which we know is untrue. So hopefully that's not too bad for you guys. Now we're going to talk about these limits right here. I already hinted to them. Let's take a deeper look. So we have our shear modulus G and we have our bulk modulus K. Our shear modulus, which is given by this formula right here, we said that we basically have two cases related to our shear modulus. The first one is when Poisson's ratio is equal to negative one. What is G when it's negative one? Infinity, exactly. We have infinite G, therefore our material is rigid and shear. Again, no matter how much shear stress I put on our object, it's not going to shear, which we know is impossible. The second one is, of course, if it's less than negative one, if that's the case, this will become negative. And what this means is that a positive shear results in a negative shear stress. Makes no sense. If I were to take my table and I were to shear it in this direction, but under this load, the table starts going the opposite way, it makes no sense. Again, it's something I can't even physically do. How can I push to the left and the table moves right? That's basically what happens if this is negative. So in the second case, the bulk modulus, this is where we start examining the other limit of 0.5. So what happens when Poisson's ratio is 0.5 or one half? What is our bulk modulus K? Infinity, exactly. So this means that we have no volumetric strain accompanying a hydrostatic stress. So again, if I were to press in every direction by the same stress, Theoretically, it should either expand or contract, depending on the direction of the stress. This right here says it won't do anything. It'll just sit there. If we have it greater than zero, our K is now negative, which means that a positive volumetric strain results in a negative hydrostatic stress. This kind of goes back to this one. If I were to take a Q and I were to compress it, what do you think the volume should do? Should it go higher or lower? If I were to compress it on all sides, lower. Does it make sense that if I were to compress it on every side, my volume starts increasing? No, it makes no physical sense. And that's what happens when you have this case right here. So one of the things I also want to kind of touch upon is this. From our limits of Poisson's ratio, can we have a negative Poisson's ratio, a negative Poisson's ratio and still be stable? Yes. What is a negative Poisson's ratio indicating, though? You guys know? Remember, Poisson's ratio, if I were to take something, push on it, push downwards, we expect that in this direction, it's going to start expanding as I press down. I compress this, and this expands. A negative Poisson's ratio says that when I compress this, this right here is going to start contracting, too. And the opposite, if I were to take this and pull it, theoretically, we expect it to get thinner. A negative Poisson's ratio means that when I pull it, this will also start to expand. There's one of those balls. I, I looked down at Amazon, but it wouldn't ship here in time. But you can kind of pull it apart back and forth. Maybe I'll try and find a picture of it later. But it's one of those things that it can extend. For civil engineering materials, concrete, steel, Aluminum, masonry, timber, all those fun things. Do you expect them to have a positive or a negative Poisson's ratio? Positive. What do you think they're around? What do you think steel is? 0.3. Yeah, it's 0.3. Concrete a little bit lower. It's around 0.2. But this is where it gets fun. A lot of you guys, or let's say half of you are in 374, you're designing. Right, you're designing actual structures using the Canadian code book, right? That has to be complex. Like that code book is responsible for all your lives. 
a steel beam above this lecture hall, well, it's probably a concrete slab, but let's just pretend it's a steel beam. It was designed using that code book. You guys have used that code book. How many times does Poisson's ratio appear in there? None. Isn't that crazy? So this is where you guys as engineers are going to have to start thinking outside of the box. Code says one thing, theory says another. Have you guys accounted for different expansions when you guys did your calculations for columns? No. The code book is conservative. But the code book is scary. And this is why we learn theory. I had my aunt. And she said, well, it is structural engineering. I said, well, basically, we learn all the theory. Then we learn the code book. And we design buildings to meet the code book. And she says, well, if you're just designing buildings to meet the code book, why do you need the theory? Like, shouldn't you just learn the code book inside and out? And I thought, well, maybe. <laughs> the answer is no, because as you're going to see, the code book is simplified. Right. For steel, they kind of account for this. But let's take concrete. Concrete columns or beams. You can either have them as pinned or fixed in A23.3. Pinned or fixed. In reality, what are they? Are they pinned? Are they fixed? It's more towards fixed because they create a very stiff connection, but they're not perfectly fixed. The code book simplifies a lot of things. And if you rely just on the code book, you're going to get in trouble in certain scenarios. In steel, which you guys are doing in 374, you guys have covered beams. You guys have covered columns, probably beam columns. You guys covered torsion. Ooh, did you know that there's four internal forces, not three? We always learn axial load, shear, and bending moment. But there's a fourth. It's a bitch. Torsion. That's what happens when my beam starts twisting along its axis. Did you guys learn that? No. And you guys are saying, well, Clayton, we don't need to. The code book will save us. I just have to use the code book equations. The code, S16, for torsion, just says, make sure it doesn't fail in torsion. It doesn't give you any equations. It doesn't give you anything. It just says, make sure it doesn't fail in torsion. What do you do then? So this is why it's important to know the theory, because a lot of the torsion stuff comes from here. Torsion, as you're going to see, it's absolutely disgusting. It's a bunch of differential equations. It's related to biology in some way. I'm not even sure where that came from, but it's a mess. Another thing you guys will figure out very quickly when you're in industry is that safety is important, of course. So is money. Those of you taking steel, for those in 372, I know I'm, I'm losing you guys, but in 374, you learn about lateral torsional buckling. What does that mean? It's a form of instability. If I were to take a long slender column and compress it, you guys know that it's going to bend and buckle. Lateral torsional buckling happens in beams under moment. If I were to take this as my beam and I were to apply a moment, to it. Watch what happens to the mid-span. Does it pop out of the plane? Yes, that's lateral torsional buckler. Something pops out. Now, question for you in 374. You guys have covered lateral torsional buckler, right? Let's say that my moment on the beam, applied moment, was 350. And my lateral torsional buckling strength was 340. So it's below our actual applied moment. Would you guys say it's good? Who would say, no, Clayton, I'm not stamping that drawing? All right, help. who would stamp it? This is where all the tricks come in. I would stamp it. What? You kidding me? This is where I start to laugh, or not laugh because it's kind of mean, let's go over to the drawing board where a lot of students will come to me and say, Clayton, I like structures. I want to be structural. I say, oh, that's great. Did you apply for your master's yet? No. Well, why would I apply for my master's? Well, you're going to need it. 
because realistically what you guys learn is a very small fraction of actual design. Let's consider, I'm getting completely off topic, but I think it's important. Let's consider a beam system where we have three beams. And again, I were to analyze the beam in the middle and I were to say, okay, I have 350 applied, but my strength is only 340. You guys say no. I would not stamp this because, of course, I'm applying more than the resistance. Tell me this. If this beam were to lateral torsionally buckle, so it's, oh, that's the highlighter. That's not what I want. If this were to buckle, so it's going to buckle outwards like this. Is this going to buckle but these two members stay perfectly straight? No. If this were to truly buckle, Shouldn't the shape kind of be something like this? Yes. And shouldn't the force required to make these two beams also push, make this increase? Yes. So this is where you start learning in actual industry, there's a bunch of tricks to save you resistance. But you'll never learn them in undergrad. It's, it's a shame. This is called interaction buckler. You guys will never see it in undergrad, but you guys will see it later on in industry or I guess in design. All right, so back, back to the actual talk. <laughs> Are we good with these restrictions? So I'm talking about the code book. Perfect. Let's go on to an orthotropic material. What were my limits for Poisson's ratio? What, what was the high one? Half. What was the low one? Do you think they're going to be the same for here? What do you guys think? Are they going to be the same limits for an orthotropic material? No. So this is where things start to get a little bit fun. So for an orthotropic material, when we derive it, we rely heavily on the fact that our elasticity tensor is positive definite. Remember, for an isotropic material, we use the, the positive definite to find the eigenvalues and go from there. But we said another way we can do it, the, the fun way, is just analyzing different stress cases. For an orthotropic material, we're kind of forced to look at the positive definite case. So if this was my relationship for an orthotropic material, which it is, if this is a uh, positive definite, the first little fun fact of positive definite is that all the diagonal components have to be positive. Again, this goes to linear algebra. I'm not going to test this, but if these components are all positive, I get the following six equations. The first three relate to the Young's modulus in the three directions, and the second three relate to the shear modulus in the three directions. What does my Young's modulus and shear modulus have to be to satisfy all this? Can my Young's modulus be negative? Can my shear modulus be negative? No. So here's what you're getting from the first one. E1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, and G1, 2, 1, 3, 1, uh, 2, 3, they all have to be greater than zero. So this is actually almost identical to an isotropic case. Remember, isotropic Young's modulus has to be positive. Well, it's the same thing over here. Where it starts to get fun are the Poisson's ratios. The Poisson's ratios. What happens? is we have to utilize the idea that the determinants of all submatrices within a positive definite matrix must also be positive. Again, this is a lot of word garbage. Basically, what's, what this means, if I were to analyze this matrix and I were to look at any submatrices inside of it, so let's say this two by two matrix, the determinants of this must also be positive. So if that's the case, and we were to, let's say, look at this submatrix right here, if I take the determinant, I'm getting this equality at the end. Again, I'm kind of going fast because you guys don't need to know this, but this is how we determine it. So if we look here, we say, okay, this isn't too bad. We have to utilize the symmetry. So E11, E22, we've already concluded that they are going to be positive. So everything is going to become related to these Poisson's ratio, new 1, 2, and new 2, 1 but I can express them in terms of each other using symmetry because we have this relationship right here. Basically, this component is equal to this component. 
So I can write mu21 as a function of mu12, and I get the following equality right here. And then I can conclude that mu12 has to be less than the square root of e11 divided by e2. A lot of fun, right? Lots of fun. If I were to do this same procedure for other sum matrices, so the one that was over here, etc., I get the following relationships. So we can conclude that mu ij has to be less than the square root of eii divided by ejj. So now we have two relationships. We have the one in the previous slide and we have this one. You think we're done? No, not yet. Turns out our final relationship comes from if we analyze this sub matrix right here. Before they were all two by two, but this one is three by three. And we get this equation after simplification. So we get this relationship right here. So in summary, Actually, yeah, I was going to ask about this up here. We have these relationships for an orthotropic material, which comes to the question, which I kind of have over here. Does this allow us to have Poisson's ratios outside of the limit of isotropic materials? For instance, could I have a Poisson's ratio of negative two? Could I? Is there anything here that says, no, it can't be less than negative one? No, it's possible. Of course, it's going to depend on the other components, but it's possible. So this is where orthotropic materials get fun. They don't have the stringent limits of isotropic materials, but it gets a little bit more complex to analyze. Now, I'm going to be honest with you guys. Dr. Sanner, he didn't cover this, orthotropic materials. And I'm not going to quiz you on orthotropic materials. I'm not going to give you a bunch of crazy orthotropic stuff. The only thing that I would quiz you on in a midterm for orthotropic materials is that question I just asked. I'll give you something like, we have an orthotropic linear elastic material with a Poisson's ratio in this direction of negative two. Is this possible? Most students are going to look at, oh, it has to be between one half negative one. No, but the answer is yes. So that's the kind of question I would give you in terms of orthotropic material. Let's say I give you a couple of these Poisson's ratios and I ask you to solve for the third one. It's going to be simple. No derivation, nothing crazy like that. So that's it for the theory. Is there any questions? No? All right. So let's go do some examples. <laughs> Are you guys getting sick of all my structural talk? No? Maybe? The reason why I talk about it is because talking about opportunity. I talked to you guys this morning. I had the best opportunity with the NG130 kids, and I pulled it off to perfection. I'm just waiting for that email I'm going to get later. Another opportunity I got today was a message from Dr. Robert Driver. He's one of the top steel guys. He's saying, Clayton, I'm teaching 374 next semester. Who's, teach who's taking 374 next semester? So a lot of you guys. And they said, Clayton, can you come teach the labs? Oh, ooh. it would be nice to see you guys again. But I really want to go to Disney World. <laughs> so I'm not too sure. <laughs> but it's one of those things that I might see you guys again next semester. I usually don't teach a lot in winter. So <laughs> I can say it's because I'm busy. I got research. I got conference. I just don't want to come to school in the cold. It's much better just staying home where it's nice and warm. <laughs> but we'll see. So you guys might see me next semester, maybe. Or I guess those of you in 372. I haven't decided if I want to teach the labs yet. It's, it's a lot of fun, but it, again, it's only steel. Steel's all right. Steel's easy. Do you guys have seen steel equations? Those of you who have seen steel equations, is there really any thinking outside of the box? No. It's just plug and chug your way through the entire course. Concrete's different. Concrete, it's not just an equation. You got to start solving for things because you got to place the rebar. Steel, it's just, okay, I have 300 kilonewton meters on my beam. You go to the steel book. Okay, what section do I pick? Uh, this one. That's it. Concrete, you actually have to place the geometry. 
What is the height of the beam? What is the thickness? Where do I place the rebar? Where do I place the stirrups? What is my aggregate size? All that fun stuff. <laughs> That's kind of outside of the point. I can tell that I would drive a Dr. Driver crazy by my coffee talk. All right, so let's look at the actual questions. Consider the limits of Poisson's ratio for our linear elastic materials, or isotropic, it should say isotropic, and match the physical implications with the value of Poisson's ratio. So one thing that you guys will see is I like to put an N so many times, and I don't know why, just muscle memory makes no sense. Oh, that's why I had it. I was wondering why I had such a large indentation, and that's because I was going to ask you guys, for an isotropic linear elastic material, what are my limits for Poisson's ratio? What's my lower limit? Negative one. And what's my upper limit? One half. So these are going to be very typical questions you guys can see in exams. Very typical, so I know these ones well. A material is incompressible, so an infinite bulk modulus, resulting in no volumetric strains accompanying a hydrostatic stress. If I were to look at my Poisson's ratio, what value of Poisson's ratio would give me this case right here? Who remembers? All right, I heard a half. But here's the trick to these questions. How many of you guys have already forgot? Exactly. I forgot. But here's the key. When you see one of these questions, it says bulk modulus equal to infinity. Do we know the formula for bulk modulus? Yes, you guys just go to the notes and we say that, okay, our bulk modulus K is equal to three divided by, or actually it's E, not three. <laughs> e divided by three and then one minus two. So this is right from the notes. So now that we know this, and we're analyzing the case where this is equal to infinity, what is my Poisson's ratio that would result in this particular case? One half. So it's one of those things that even if you don't know it just by the words, you can solve it using math. This is going to be the case where Poisson's ratio is equal to one half, which is why we say it has to be less than, not less than or equal to, just less than. So you come down to the next one, and it's the same thing. What is the scenario where we have a negative bulk modulus, which results in a positive volumetric strain accompanying a negative hydrostatic pressure? Again, physically impossible. Well, if you guys forget about it, all you guys have to do is just come back to your formula and say, hey, I know the formula for bulk modulus. You come down here, you say K is equal to E divided by 3, 1 minus 2 nu. And this has to be, oops, yeah, less than 0. Less than 0. So we know that if 1 half makes it equal to 0, what do we have to do to make this less than 0? Greater than 1 half. Exactly. So that's all these type of questions are that you get on an exam. That's why when people say, Clayton, why are you testing something we're, no, why are you teaching something we're being tested on next week? Free marks, guys. <laughs> that's why. I like giving these nice, easy questions. Again, the second midterm isn't going to be as hard as the first one. Mathematics, who knows what's going on? They analyze all those weird dimensions. They do cross product. Like, that's just for psychopaths. This right here is physically possible, so we have very nice relationships. There's no tricks. In the real world, there are no tricks. Well, there's a lot of tricks to the real world, but we won't get into those. That's outside of this course. All right, so the next one, material is rigid in shear, so an infinite shear modulus. Again, if you guys are forgetting it, just go to the formula. We know that our shear modulus, G, is equal to E divided by 2 multiplied by 1 plus nu. So if this was equal to infinity, 
what does my Poisson's ratio have to be? Negative one. So this just goes to the other limit. This is equal to negative one. If we were to come down to part D, it's the same thing where it's less or a negative shear modulus. We're going to skip that. Again, it's the same thing. Let's go into the fun one. Analyzing a scenario where no lateral strain when a material is pulled. What does that mean? Again, we're looking at what does our Poisson's ratio have to be for this to happen. If I'm pulling something, let's say this. If I were to pull it upwards, is there going to be a strain laterally? If I were to pull this right here. What do you guys think? Yes or no? Yes. So if I were to pull this upwards, like the question says, but it says that there's no lateral strain. Is this going to expand or contract? No. So this is the scenario when I take something, I pull it up, and it doesn't expand or contract in that direction. What does my Poisson's ratio have to be for that to be the case? Zero. Exactly. So for this particular case, Poisson's ratio is equal to zero. I think that's possible. I think there's a material out there with a Poisson's ratio of zero. What do you guys think? Maybe I should make that a bonus question. Should I tell you now or make it a bonus question on the exam? I thought about giving bonus questions on the exam and doing something stupid, like where every answer is right, but it's a very complex question, so it stresses everyone out a little bit. <laughs> I thought it would be too mean. Uh, there is a material, cork. Cork doesn't expand or contract when you pull it. Isn't that funny? That's why they use it in wine bottles. All right, so last one is, the material expands in the lateral direction when pulled in the longitudinal direction. So if I were to take the podium and pull it up and it starts expanding, what does that mean our Poisson's ratio is? Negative. So again, if I were to pull it and it starts expanding, our Poisson's ratio has to be negative. Now, if you guys were to give me this answer, think you get full marks? It's a good trick on exams. It is negative, yes, but is there a limit? Negative one. That would be the answer. I'd, I'd put this one first. I'd have option A as this. <laughs> Everyone would pick it. And then option D down here, kind of below, that's when I'd hit you with this. You'd be surprised at how many students fall for things like this. All right, so let's get into some actual questions. In a uniaxial state of stress, an isotropic linear elastic material subject subjected to a tensile loading of sigma 1, 1. All the other stress values are zero. So just essentially a uniaxial case. That's it. What happens to the total volume? So either A, the total volume increases, B, the total volume decreases, C, stays the same, or D, not enough information is provided to answer this question. What do you guys think it is? If I were to pull something, what do you think is going to happen to the volume for an isotropic linear elastic material? Place your bets. We're going to go through it and we can prove it mathematically, but what do you guys think? Preliminary. Did you guys get this right? I'll give you a bonus question on the exam. How about that? All the online students are counting on you guys now. All that pressure. All right, let's go to a straight up vote. Who thinks it's A? No one. Who thinks it's B? I see one hand. Who thinks it's C? Okay, so quite a bit think it's C. Who thinks it's D? Okay, so I've seen the most for C. So this is the preliminary guess. Again, if you guys don't know these kind of identities just by words, go to the math. The math will show you guys. Come down here, we say, okay, 
what is volumetric strain? It's the summation of epsilon 1, 1, 2, 2, and 3, 3, right? That's the volumetric strain. So in order to answer this question, all we're doing is finding these three components, which is why I have it written in pink. If you guys go to your isotropic linear elastic laws, there's my clicker, this is what you guys get. Now, the question said that we are pulling uniaxially. So we have sigma 1, 1. If I were to look at these, what is sigma 2, 2? Zero. It says right in the question. All of the stress components are zero. What is sigma 3, 3? Zero. So what is epsilon 1, 1 equal to? Well, it's just going to be equal to sigma 1, 1 divided by E. We go to epsilon 2, 2 now. What is sigma 1, 1? Is that zero? No. 2, 2 is zero? Yes. And 3, 3 is zero? Yes. This is zero. This is zero. So epsilon 2, 2 is negative nu sigma 1, 1 divided by E. The last one that we have, epsilon 3, 3, we have negative nu sigma 1, 1 over E. Is this going to be equal to zero? No. How about these two? Yes. So all these go bye-bye. It's equal to negative nu sigma 1, 1, all divided by E. So if I were to come down here and say, okay, I want my volumetric strain, which is just those three added together, it's equal to, I'm just going to take out the sigma 1, 1 over E because it appears in all the terms. So we get 1 minus nu minus nu. So in general, we know that this is going to be equal to sigma 1, 1 over E. 1 minus 2 nu. So now we have to analyze this. We weren't given any values. But we said that sigma 1, 1, or the case that we have, it's being pulled. Tension. Is sigma 1, 1 going to be negative? If something's in tension, no, it's going to be positive. Can E be negative based on our limits? So the only way that we can analyze this is we have to look at this part right here. So I'm just going to kind of go down a bit. I'm going to say, okay, we've already concluded that this part right here, it's going to be positive. What about the second part? We have one minus two times nu. Is that always going to be positive or is it going to be negative or what's that going to be? Always positive. If you guys are unsure, just substitute the two boundaries in. What happens if I were to put in nu is equal to 0.5? What is this expression equal to if I were to put in 0.5? Zero. Again, that's not physically possible. It has to be less than 0.5, but it's just finding the boundaries. If I were to look at the other boundary, nu is equal to negative 1, what's this equal to? 2, or sorry, 1 minus 2 times negative 1. Three. I know it's hard math. Three. So if this is my range right here, will that value always be positive? Yes. So this is always positive. Therefore, this is always positive. So if both of those terms are always positive, what can I say about my volumetric strain? Always positive. So what does this mean here? It means that our total volume is increasing. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? We talked about this. You guys fell for the oldest trick in the book. I said that we have two different things. We have hydrostatic, not hydrostatic, but basically stress is applied in the normal directions, and we have shear. I said one of those does not change the volume, one of those. That was shear. Shear doesn't change the volume. Stress is applied to normal directions, does change the volume. It's just shear that doesn't. 
So again, that's the oldest trick in the book. I guess no bonus question for you guys. Unless you guys can answer this question. Are you guys ready for some redemption? The limits of Poisson's ratio for an orthotropic material can allow for Poisson's ratio in a particular direction to take values outside of the linear elastic material range. We talked about this. It says let nu 1, 2 and 1, 3 equal 1. Then if a material is stretched in a direction with a tensile stress of sigma 1, 1, the volume increases, decreases, stays the same, or not enough information is provided. Same scenario as we had before, but now we have an orthotropic material. So place your bets. Who thinks the volume is going to increase? Who thinks the volume is going to decrease? Who thinks the volume is going to stay the same this time? Who thinks not enough information is provided? No one voted for any single one. <laughs> so now we're gonna make this fun. I get to pick on someone. And you know I'm picking on you. You have to answer this question. But before you do, look back. Those are all the classmates depending on you. <laughs> so what do you think? It's okay to get it wrong. They failed you in the first question. <laughs> B, how are you guys feeling about that class? I, I see thumbs up. Classmates are trusting you. All right, so let's go through it again. It's the exact same question where all we're doing is finding that volumetric strain. This would deal with the volume. So epsilon 1, 1 plus epsilon 2, 2 plus 3, 3. We come down here, and for an orthotropic material, these are our relations. You guys can just get this right from the tensor, right from the tensor. If all the components besides sigma 1, 1 are equal to 0, is this component equal to 0? Yes, because that's sigma 2, 2, which is 0. Is sigma 3, 3 going to be 0? Yes, we only have sigma 1, 1. So epsilon 1, 1 is sigma 1, 1 divided by E. Same as before. Uh-oh. Let's go to the next one. Sigma 2, 2, again, is 0. Sigma 3, 3, again, is 0. So we got negative nu 1, 2, sigma 1, 1, divided by E. And if we go to the last one, again, these two cancel. So this is equal to negative nu 1, 3, sigma 1, 1, divided by E. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to come down and say, okay, my volumetric strain is just the summation of those three components. So we know that epsilon V, volumetric strain, each component has sigma 1, 1 over E. So I'm going to factor that out. E, 1, 1. In all these cases, it's 1, 1. I forgot to put that. Perfect. And then we have 1 minus nu 1, 2 minus nu 1, 3. So it's almost identical as before. The only difference now is nu 1, 2 and 1, 3 are different. It's not just nu. We have two different nu's, two different Poisson's ratios because we have different directions. Is my first term sigma 1, 1 divided by E? Is this always going to be positive? We have a tensile stress, and we have it divided by Young's modulus. Is that always going to be positive? Yes. So this is always going to be positive. What about the second term? How do you guys know that? We give you nu 1, 2, and 1, 3. If you look here, <laughs> Nu 1, 2, and 1, 3 are equal to 1 in this case. So if we look at the second term, we have 1 minus 1 minus 1, which is equal to, in the end, negative 1 or just a negative. 
So in this case, is my volumetric strain going to be positive or negative? Negative. So answer B is correct. Yes. You guys get a bonus question. <laughs> but here's the fun, and this is what I want to warn you guys, because this would be a great question for an exam. Was this negative all the time, or was it negative because they picked very specific values of mu 1, 2, and 1, 3? Could I have given a different set of values for these two to make it positive? Can I give specific values to make it zero? So that's what you have to be careful for. Isotropic materials, what we proved before, it's always true. For orthotropic materials, depending on what I give you, it can change. The reason why isotropic was true is because we looked at the two limits. If I were to pick any value that's physically possible between these two, it's always still going to be positive. For an orthotropic material, I can pick specific values to make it negative. Is having a Poisson's ratio of one physically possible for an isotropic material? What, were the, what was the upper limit of for an isotropic material? 0.5. So is this possible? It's not. Do you guys know any materials? that would have a Poisson's ratio this high. Of course, they're not going to be isotropic. We talked a bit about it. On the lower end, when we have negative Poisson's ratios, those are materials that are basically engineered biologically. Stuff that's in our body or stuff that has very specific patterns. A lot of the tissue in our body, when you stretch it, it actually expands. So it's negative Poisson's ratio. What about on the other side? What would have Poisson's ratio that's just absolutely big. Greater than one half. Can you guys think of something that expands like crazy? Foam. You guys ever see that spray foam? Foam. That expands like crazy. That would be one of the particular cases. So it's just one of those little fun facts to know. Again, orthotropic materials, I can give you a different Poisson's ratios and I can make it however I want. Isotropic materials, they're more bound. So that's it for the questions, is uh, like the example questions. Do you guys have any questions? Midterms, content, anything? Yes. If you remember it, no. That's the nice thing. The only reason why I show the math is because it's, again, if I were to give a bunch of statements up here, if you know it, perfect. You can circle it, save time, but if you don't know it, you can rely on the math to solve it. So you guys have that backup option, if you will. Yes? Are there any questions on assignment seven that will cover On assignment seven, no. So today, it's all going to be beams. Assignment seven is all going to be beams. Unfortunate. <laughs> Assignment seven isn't due until after reading week, though, so you guys have lots of time to do that. I know that you guys are going to save it till the very end, though. You have no idea how many questions I got last night, an hour before the, what was it, Assignment five was due? It's not that bad. Uh, yeah, no, I know that you guys are busy, though, so it is what it is. All right, guys, that's it for today. Uh, next lecture, we're going to be covering beams. Thank you all.